Fairfax. Oh. Hey, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say, and my first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? Oh, with pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? Oh, if you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Papa, I suppose? I don't think so. Outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that's quite how it should be. The home seems to me the proper sphere for the man, and certainly once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. <laughs> Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It's part of her system. Do you mind if I look in at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. You're here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother. No, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh, what a strange he never mentioned to me he had a ward. How oh, secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I'm not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I'm very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now that I know you're Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a bit older than you seem to be, and not quite so alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly. I do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily. I wish you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature, and he is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. I but even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the physical charms and influence of others. This is very true. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. I agree. If it were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they've not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it then. And now that I think of it, I have never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful among most men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship such as ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. I'm quite sure. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon. Uh, dearest Gwendolyn, there's no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper should sure chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Darling, Cecily, I fear there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. That is strange. He asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon. If you'd care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I am so sorry, dear Cecily, if it is any disappointment to you. But I am afraid that I have the prior claim. Mm -hmm. It would distress me more than I could tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish. But I feel bound to point out that since it is proposed to you, he has clearly changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I will consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. 
Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have gotten himself into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous! On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrap Ernest into an engagement? Well, how dare you! This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. <laughs> I am glad to say I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. <clears throat> Shall I lay tea here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. There are many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew. Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that's why you live in town. a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anybody can manage to exist in the country. If anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, that is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it at present. It's almost an epidemic amongst them, or so I've been told. Uh, may I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Yes. Thank you. Detestable girl. I require tea. Sugar. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter, please. Cake is rarely seen at the best houses nowadays. known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far! To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no legs to which I will not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you 